began to teach an introduction to Islamic eschatology. And I argued that the pivotally most important subject of all in the Quran with which to study Islamic eschatology is Gog and Magog. Because Gog and Magog are firmly located in the Quran, in the Ayat Muhkamat. Name mentioned by name in the Quran. But the subject of Dajjal is in the Quran, but only Ayat Mutashabihat. You have to interpret them, excuse me. And so I was devoting attention to Gog and Magog when Eid al Fitr came and my, my, my uh, sessions had to be suspended because my daughter was having her exams at the university. And uh, I remember while introducing the subject of Gog and Magog, I said, this is the test of Islamic scholarship. It is this subject which separates those who know Islamic eschatology and those who don't. Hmm? Those who have Islamic scholarship for Akhir Zaman and those who don't. This is the subject. This is the defining, defining subject in Akhir Zaman, the subject of Gog and Magog. If you understand the subject of Gog and Magog correctly, then you can turn to the subject of Dajjal. Hmm? So now, the rabbis had asked, ask Muhammad Islam these three questions, which only a prophet can answer. So you cannot find the answer in history, in the books of history. No. Historical data cannot answer. Ask him about the great traveler who travels to the two ends of the land. If this was a historical personality, anybody could answer it. But only a prophet could answer this. So it cannot be a historical personality. Yet I'm mean inundated. No, 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 Sheikh, it was Cyrus. No, 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 Sheikh, it was Suleiman. No, no, Sheikh, it was this or that and the other. The great traveler is not someone whose name is located in history because only a prophet knows him. Only a prophet can answer the question about the great traveler. So please don't, <laughs> don't, don't send me your emails arguing that the great traveler or Alexander or this one or the other one. Save me that time, please. He traveled to the two ends of the land. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to the question. And notice his methodology of response. That he first repeats the question and then he answers it. And his answer was, And they question you about Zul Karnayn. Now then, here is the first major test of scholarship. What is Zulkar name? Not who is Zulkar name. Karn means a horn. But Karn can also mean a generation, a people, an epoch, an era. Which one is it? Proper scholarship is that you go to the Quran for the answer. Let the Quran answer it. If the Quran does not answer it, then you can go to the Prophet. This is proper scholarship. So let us go to the Quran. This is what I did in Ramadan. I'm teaching you how to study. Does the Quran ever use the word karna to mean a horn? No. 
the Quran uses the word karn many times, but never uses the word karn to mean a horn. And so that is bogus scholarship, which says that Zulkarnain is someone with two horns. No, forget that scholarship. We don't waste your time with them. When the Quran speaks of Zulkarnain, the Quran is not speaking of someone with two horns. Therefore, what does it mean? It means that the Quran is speaking about someone who impacts on two ages, two peoples, two generations. And the Quran now proceeds to tell us about the first one. This is scholarship. <laughs> the Quran proceeds to tell us about the first karna. Will you not think? What's wrong that you stop thinking? You must now direct your attention. If this was the first karna, what will be the second? That is scholarship. But Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, he said it, and it is such a sad statement. That great scholar of Islam, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, he said this, oh, must stop thinking 500 years ago. Tell that to the Mufti for me. And so, Zulkarnain is a traveler whose story impacts on two ages, two epochs, two generations, two people. Mm -hmm. Now then, we will have to devote attention to the second current. But we can only do that after we've studied the first current. Mm -hmm. And in the first current, we are told, the first current means the first age, the first time, we are told that Zulkarnain is someone who's been endowed by Allah with power. But he also has faith, faith in Allah. And so when power rests on the foundations of faith, how will power be used? The Quran proceeds to tell us about the first journey and then tells us about the second journey. The first journey ended where land finished and there's only water. So the second journey will have to finish where land finishes and there's only water. Mm -hmm. So between two bodies of water, he travels. Mm -hmm. But the Quran did not stop there. Allah knew that the rabbis wanted to know whether Nabi Muhammad wasalam, knew about the third journey. It was the third journey which led to Gog and Magog. And Gog and Magog is a subject only a prophet would know about. Our prophet said about Gog and Magog, when they are released, yes, he said the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Jerusalem. And by the time the last of them pass, by the Sea of Galilee, on the way to Jerusalem, they say there used to be water here. Hmm. There's a very famous prophecy of Nabi Muhammad And so the Sea of Galilee has pivotal strategic importance in Akhirul Zaman. The water can go up and go down, but we know that so long as there is water in the Sea of Galilee, Gog and Magog are still passing by. But this hadith gives us two things to hold on to. Number one, that because they have to pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Jerusalem, they're coming from the north. Did you hear that? The Sea of Galilee is located north of Jerusalem. So if you are passing by the Sea of Galilee to reach to Jerusalem, you're coming from the north, north of the Holy Land. So we have to look for two bodies of water located to the right and to the left, the east and the west, north of the Holy Land to find the geography 
of Gog and Magog. Are you following me? Or do you go to school only in the holidays? Hmm? The second thing that this hadith tells us of is that Gog and Magog have a link with a certain town or city. That town or that city is Jerusalem. The name of Gog and Magog is linked with a town or a city. And that town or that city is Jerusalem. These are the two main things that we get from this hadith. And the third one, of course, is that the water level in the Sea of Galilee will constantly decrease while Gog and Magog are passing by. Now then, so now, Zulkardain travels in the direction of the setting of the sun. And uh, that is going westward, isn't it? And he comes to a body of water, can't go any further. And that body of water is Ainun Hamia, dark and murky. Well then, can we identify that body of water? For you and I, it's so simple. For Ibn Kathir, it was so simple. But for those who refuse to think or find it inconvenient to think, it's a different matter. There are only two bodies of water, two. Uh, sorry, not two, one. <laughs> only one body of water north of the Holy Land. The Mediterranean Sea is not north of the Holy Land. The Mediterranean Sea is bordering the Holy Land. It laps, the water laps on the Holy Land. Hmm? That's the Mediterranean Sea, so to the west of the Holy Land. So to the north of the Holy Land, there's only one body of water. It's called the Black Sea. And the reason why it is called the Black Sea is because it's the, there's so much algae, or algae, I don't know how you pronounce that word, in the water that visibility is very, very shallow. That's why it's said dark and murky. Hmm? And so it is very easy for us, for us, not for them, for us, it is very easy for us to recognize the geography of what we're talking about. So Zulkarnain has traveled in the direction of the Black Sea. And there, in the direction of the, at the, at the Black Sea, the story begins of Gog and Magog, of, of Zulkarnain. It begins there, at the Black Sea. And there he comes across a people, and Allah asks him, Allah asked him, did Allah speak to Alexander? Did Allah speak to Cyrus? Did Allah speak to Tom, Dick, and Harry? Eh? Allah spoke to him and asked him, how are you going to treat these people? Why don't you think before you rush to judgment eh, that that Zulkarnain is Alexander, and Zulkarnain is Cyrus, and Zulkarnain is Suleiman, and this and that and the other. Why don't you think Allah is speaking to him? Hmm? And Allah asks him, how are you going to treat these people? His response was, those who are wicked, those who are oppressors, those who are unjust, those who commit acts of zulum, I will punish them. And when they return to you, you will punish them as well. But those who are people of faith and who are righteous in conduct, I will treat them nicely and I will reward them. This is his response. And so now, we know about the first karn. The first karn is that when power manifests itself on the foundations of faith in the region of the Black Sea, Power will be used to punish the oppressor, to punish those who are unjust, those who are wicked. And power will be used to reward those who have faith and who are righteous in conduct, treat them nicely. This is the first Khan, and this is the region of the Black Sea. 
And we know that Crimea commands the Black Sea. Whoever commands Crimea, controls Crimea, commands the Black Sea. And this is why for centuries, from the time of Genghis Khan, centuries there have been power rivalry for control of, the, of Crimea, the peninsula of Crimea. The last major war before the two world wars that was fought in the world was the Crimean War. I have about three books on the Crimean War in my library at home. Yeah. And I've read on the Crimean War. So Crimea can, has a strategic role to play in respect of the manifestation of power in the region of the Black Sea. So when the second of the two currents is to occur, what will the world see? Are you listening? When the second of the two currents is to occur, power will once again manifest itself in the region of the Black Sea where Crimea commands the Black Sea. And that power will rest on the foundations of faith. And that power will be used to resist and to punish the oppressor. And power will be used to punish those who are op un unjust and wicked in their conduct. And power will be used to reward those who have faith and who are righteous in conduct. That is the second card. I should not have to do your thinking for you. Why can't you think yourself? This is why I know so many emails I'm getting. People ask, Sheikh, is it permissible for us to perform Salat standing three feet apart from each other? And my answer is, why don't you think? Do I have to do your thinking for you? Can't you think for yourself? Something so elementary like that. Sheikh, but all the muftis give that fatwa. Forget the muftis. Allah gave you a capacity to think. Won't you think? Hmm? Tomorrow Allah will take me away from this world. So you should not be depending on me to do all your thinking for you. No. What kind of students I have who don't think? Hmm? So don't say, check this, check that, check that, when you can answer the question yourself. And so now we know that when power manifested itself on the first journey, it manifested itself in the region of the Black Sea. Now then, listen carefully. Are you listening? <laughs> in the first current, when power rested on the foundations of faith and it manifested itself in the region of the Black Sea, what did power do after that? Are you listening in Moscow? Answer, power moved in east direction, in the direction of east. Power went east, and therefore power would not go down this way to Washington and to Bonn and to Paris and London or this way, not to the west. Power will move east from the Black Sea. That is the destiny waiting. Those who are blessed to have power in Akhiru Zaman, power resting on the foundations of faith, and that power manifesting itself in Akhiru Zaman in the region of the Black Sea, which Crimea commands. I'm doing my thinking for you. Think about it, and you will now construct the house of knowledge that I'm building, only the foundation for you. That power will have to move east, not west. So Zulkarnain then traveled in the direction of the rising of the sun, and that's the destiny. That's the destiny of the second of the two currents as well. The second of the two currents will have to move Tell them this in Moscow. We'll have to move 
in the direction of the rising of the sun. There are many in Russia who are not going to be happy with what I'm saying. They're not going to be happy because they are wedded with the Western world. Hmm. When he traveled in the direction of the rising of the sun, he came across a people, listen to the Quran. I have studied this, I, uh, I don't know how, 20, 25 years now. And uh, slowly, slowly, painfully slowly, agonizingly slowly, I'm beginning to understand the ayah. Knowledge doesn't come like this on your plate. You have to plant to be able to, be able to reap. Hmm? Allah says about the people he met at the si rising of the sun when he reached the Caspian Sea now. Hmm? That was the Black Sea on this side. There's the Caspian Sea on that side. There's Azerbaijan, there's Iran, there's Georgia, there's Russia. All these are li literal states of the Caspian Sea. Um, لَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُمْ مِنْ دُونِهَا سِتْرَ These are just a few words. And we did not provide for them as a sitr, a covering, other than what was provided. I have always felt that this meant that they were living a primitive way of life. But now I realize that, no, I have to revise that and refine it. So I have to now connect the East with the West. Power in the second of the two currents will have to travel in the direction of the rising of the sun. But there is another rising of the sun, <laughs> of the Jal. <laughs> and that is, the sun will rise from the West. <laughs> and my opinion, and you don't have to accept my opinion, of course. My critics never accept is that that's modern Western civilization, the sun rising from the West. And so power in the second of the two currents will have to travel in the direction of the rising of the sun, which is east, rather than this bogus rising, false sunrise in the West. This false sunrise in the West offers to mankind a very sophisticated way of life. That rising of the sun on the east. Lam najallahum min dunia sitra indicates a people of life people living in that part of the world who lived the natural way of life. The natural way of life, not the sophisticated way of life of modern West Western This is the first time in 25 years that I'm offering this view. I never did it before. Hmm? Because knowledge, alhamdulillah, constantly grows. And so in the second of the two currents, power will travel in the direction of the rising of the sun, which is the sun rising from the east, not rising from the west. And so power will be moving in the direction of, of a people who still live the natural way of life, rather than the sophisticated way of life of those whose sun rise from the West. Mm -hmm. This is modern Western civilization. That's the destiny if they're listening to me in Moscow. And then Zulkarnain had the good sense to allow these people to continually <laughs> continue to live the natural way of life rather than to transform them into the, what I call the blue jeans, Jamat. <laughs> Excuse me, let me take some water. I once gave a talk in Boston <laughs> on this subject, and a little 11 year old girl was horrified. 
went to her grandfather. What's wrong with blue jeans? <laughs> this was 20, 20, 20 something years ago. So I call them the blue jeans, Jamal. The one global society we're talking about. The one global society. The one global society would be a global society which, which will depart from the natural way of life. Lam naja'allahum min duniha sitra. The natural way of life. And the, the blue jeans, Jamaat, will be those who will be absorbed in the sophisticated way of life which comes from those whose sun is rising from the West. And then Zulkarnain traveled, having left them, having, the, having had the wisdom to allow these people to live the natural way of life rather than the sophisticated way. He then traveled in the third direction. And that third direction took him to a pass between the mountain ranges. This is the Caucasus Mountains. And there's only one pass in this mountain range, and that's the Dariel Gorge. And the Quran tells us about the pass. It says that the two sides of the pass is Baina Sadafain, that it was like the two sides of a shell, you know, slightly curved like this. Looking at my hands, Sadafain. And up to this day, at the Dariel Gorge, you see the mountains, like the two sides of a shell. Hmm? And so it is there that he came across a people on his third journey. He could not understand. No one could understand their language because their language was unique. It was unconnected with any other languages in the region, and that is to this day the Georgian language. The Georgian language is unconnected with any other regional languages. And so we now have the geography of the location, the Dariel Gorge. And there the people ask him, can you help us? Can you build a barrier for us to protect us from Gog and Magog? Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil ard. That Gog and Magog are committing fasad. Fasad is that corruption which destroys, destructive corruption. It, for Allah, reserves the worst punishment of all. This is... Um, Punishment which is intended to prevent others from doing it. I've forgotten the word now, what is you uh, used for that kind of punishment, in the philosophy of punishment. Deterrent punishment, that's it, deterrent punishment. Deterrent punishment, cut off their hands and feet from opposite sides and crucify them. Mm. This is in the Quran. This is for Fasad. And this is what Gaga and Magaga are doing. Fasad. Gog and Magog have to be human beings. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there are only three categories of beings that Allah created. They are angels, they are jinn, and they are human beings. When, 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 when will you learn to think? And when Allah sent human beings, he sent them to live on the earth, not in the interior of the earth. When will you learn to think? Hmm? So Gog and Magog are human beings. They're not angels and they're not jinn. I'll tell you why in a, moment, in a moment. So they said, we are prepared to pay you if you can build a barrier to protect us because this is the gorge and they're behind the gorge. If you can block this, then they can't come and we are safe from them. Zulkarnain should have said, okay, I'll do it because he has the power to punish the oppressor. That's what he just said. Uh, when Allah asked him, how will you use your power, how will you treat them? He said, I'll punish the oppressor, I'll punish the wicked. So why did he not say, I'll punish them, I'll, the wicked people, the oppressors, the people committing facade? Why did he not say that? Answer, because Allah says about Gog and Magog, I have created 
creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. None but I can fight with them. So they have a power which no earthly power can resist. They are indestructible in the worldly sense of the world. Only Allah can destroy them. That is Gog and Magog. So he said, I will build a barrier, meaning he cannot destroy them. He said, bring me blocks of iron. And uh, therefore, you need iron ore. And you need a furnace to melt the iron, to make blocks of iron. And this is what the Quran speaks of. And therefore, look in the region of Dariel Gorge, and do you see lots of iron ore? Up to this day, it is filled with iron ore. That's the geography of the region. And so they brought the iron ore, they built a furnace, they made the blocks of iron, smelted it, and then he built the barrier to block, to block the passage, the path. And when he blocked it, he then coated it with copper, molten copper. And neither could Gog and Magog penetrate, nor could they scale it. Had they been jinn, they could fly over it. <laughs> they could pass through the wall if they're jinn. So they can't be jinn, they have to be human beings. And angels don't commit facade, so they have to be human beings. And human beings don't live in the interior of the earth. They live on the earth. وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرُّ وَمَتَاوٌ إِلَى So now, Gog and Magog are contained behind the barrier. And then Zulkarnain says, هَذَا رَحْمَةُ مِنْ رَبِّي فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي جَاءَ لَهُ دَكَّا وَكَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي حَقَّا That this is a wall constructed by Allah's mercy. But when that warning of Allah comes to pass, he will destroy the barrier and Gog and Magog will be released. This is the first current. When the barrier is released, then the people are going to be released into the world. Are you listening? When the barrier is broken down by Allah, a people are going to be released into the world who will have a power that none can resist. So they'll be able to take control of the world. But they will be a people who will use power to oppress, use power in a way which is wicked and unjust. And so there'll be facade all over the world when these people are released released. Now then, will you think, I have a minute left, we live today in an age where there is corruption all over the world. There is facade in the political system, there is facade in the economy, there is facade in the monetary system, there is facade in education, there is facade in sports, there is facade in agriculture. Shall I continue? All around us there is facade, there is total corruption in the world. And Allah says in the Quran, He sent this Quran to explain all things. Where is the explanation other than Gog and Magog? They don't want to think, so leave them. But you and I would think and recognize that barrier was brought down already. Gog and Magog was already released. And when we come back next week, inshallah, we go to the second part of the Quran where Allah deals with Gog and Magog. And you will understand the Quran is teaching us that Gog and Magog have already been released. And now comes the second current. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.